Yes, so we are the workshop on healthy, happy, and holistic living. And uh, we had a wonderful workshop. I do want to thank all the workshop participants. On Monday, we had probably 35 or so folks. And uh, there was a little bit of attrition to Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday, we had about 25, which is not bad. So people continued to be happy uh, into this workshop. Um, and uh, I was of course, joined by none other than Pat Mokhtarian as uh, co-chair uh, for this workshop, but I will uh, provide the report. And so our goal was to define a research agenda on the role of transport in uh, enhancing quality of life. So what is a good research agenda to pursue uh, as we think about uh, how transportation can engender uh, healthy, healthy, healthful, and happy uh, lives for people and enhance quality of life overall. So just to quickly uh, define, uh, when we talk about healthy, it's essentially the interplay between transportation, the infrastructure, the physical activity, and the health outcomes uh, that are engendered by the transportation system. Um, happy, which is uh, everything from your travel satisfaction, to your overall quality of life and well-being. Um, and then with the holistic, it was really your lifestyle choices, uh, looking at your green lifestyle choices and moving towards more sustainable uh, communities, uh, adopting electric vehicles and an alternative modes of transportation. So we tried to cover these in kind of an overall quality of life perspective and, and where transportation can fit in. So our discussion on Monday was a very freewheeling kind of discussion, and if we just you know, throw, put the notes into the uh, word cloud conveyor belt, this is what came out, and uh, makes a little bit of sense. Uh, essentially, you can see well-being and people are front and center in what we try to do as travel behavior researchers, which made uh, quite a bit of sense. Um, and you can see kind of the emphasis on active modes of transportation, bike, uh, of course car, but car was talked about in various ways, uh, both in terms of perhaps how it enhances your action space uh, and your activity set of opportunities, but perhaps also has adverse consequences uh, from a health perspective. Um, so you can see some of the other uh, interesting words in there, non-motorized and so on. There is the word bad. I'm not sure exactly what was bad, but uh, something was bad, so that did come out there and so on. Um, so with this helped guide uh, some of our thought process. Um, there was considerable discussion about uh, subjective versus uh, objective measures of well-being. Uh, we do have data about how people feel with respect to their lives and with respect to you know, different activities, happiness, meaningfulness, stress, tiredness, and so on. But perhaps we need to be thinking also about objective measures of well-being. And we talked about the ingredients of such uh, objective measures. And these were just some of the thoughts that uh, came out of that discussion uh, in terms of what might be objective measures and perhaps how they might tie into people's uh, life cycle and time use and so on. Um, if we take the discussion from Monday and, uh, and then uh, try to, just, yeah, indeed, uh, try to distill that <laughs> into research topics, um, we came up with a smorgasbord of research topics, somewhat interrelated, so I'll quickly review those. And then we tried to converge and do a deeper dive into specific topics. Um, so see, here are some topics. There was, again, considerable discussion about how do we define what are these measures of happiness and health and holistic living that we want to use or embrace? Uh, and, uh, and how can transportation be front and center in uh, the, you know, the measurement and definition of those measures of well-being. Uh, what's the relationship between objective and subjective measures of well-being, the time scale that we need to consider, um, and, and so on. There was also considerable discussion about the holistic, thinking about physical well-being as well as mental well-being, and how we need to incorporate and think about both of those dimensions uh, together. Um, there was considerable discussion about the influence of the built environment. Uh, so if you just think about the supply of opportunities, the supply of modal options, uh, 
And how does the supply, both from a built environment and from an infrastructure and modal level of modal options perspective, uh, impact your well-being and your happiness and health outcomes and so on? So two and three kind of go together because it's all about opportunities, access to those opportunities, um, and uh, multimodal access and how that impacts well-being. Then we had quite a bit of discussion on Monday about the potential conflicts within us. And if you think about, you know, you want to enhance travel, and we often consider if people are able to access opportunities and travel farther and seek adventure and so on, that perhaps enhances their well-being. But at the same time, perhaps there are other consequences uh, as a result of that in terms of congestion and the carbon footprint and the sustainability of our transportation uh, system in our communities. So we talked about this conflict, this potential competing forces at play, where on the one hand we want to encourage and perhaps facilitate travel and access to far off places, but on the other hand, uh, are there uh, you know, issues that arise from that? I don't know if you read the most recent article, kept up with the news, that the air quality in our national parks is, uh, I guess, worse than or as bad as the 20 worst cities in the United States with respect to air quality. So you can think about, well, what's happening there is you've facilitated all this travel and great you know, adventure at the national parks, but with some adverse consequences. Um, so how do, we, uh, how do we facilitate and continue to enhance well-being, facilitate access to wonderful destinations, but while minimizing these adverse consequences? So there was considerable discussion. Four, five, and six is all related to that. Um, how can we inspire people to perhaps uh, sacrifice certain things uh, for the common good, perhaps sacrifice short-term happiness for long-term benefits or gains uh, uh, from a society perspective or even from a personal perspective. So uh, all of these came into play um, in terms of that debate. Um, we uh, did certainly have connections with our sister workshops at this conference. Uh, Natural is the time use uh, workshop, so uh, Chandra's uh, rapporteurs uh, from that workshop actually mentioned well-being. So certainly we talked about how time allocation and time use impacts well-being. Um, and also with um, the, the workshop that Yoram and Amanda uh, chaired with respect to what's, uh, you know, what's the impact of emerging technologies and autonomous vehicles and what are those technologies going to do in terms of people's well-being uh, and happiness. Uh, perhaps uh, AVs and mobility as a service increase but also could decrease well-being. So how do we realize the increase in well-being because you're able to travel and it's much more convenient and so on. Uh, but uh, while minimizing any adverse consequences as a result of that, one example was the dockless bike share system, which has uh, inspired a lot more bicycling, but with now bicycles strewn across sidewalks, potentially impeding those who, need, you know, those who want to walk or perhaps use wheelchairs and need to navigate the sidewalk safely. Um, there's a discussion about adoption of green choices and uh, strategies and incentives that might work. So despite lots of uh, efforts, uh, the penetration of electric vehicles and so on remains quite modest. So how can we bring about some behavioral change uh, that could, again, advance uh, societal well-being and goals? Um, going back to Elisabetta's uh, kind of presentation uh, on uh, Monday morning, uh, we did think that we need to try and map to the genome a little bit. And so we talked about, well, how can we connect? And perhaps there is in all of us some genetic and, and predisposition towards optimism or pessimism or happiness or just, you know, our personalities and so on are in all kinds of varieties. So perhaps we need to map that genome and think about the role of genetic predisposition uh, in, in you know, in determine, determining well-being. Um, and so, and then what's the role that transport can play in shaping, uh, shaping that? 
Uh, there was also discussion about causal decision processes. So if we're trying to you know, uh, introduce policy interventions and designs and modal options and so on to enhance travel and well-being, perhaps we need to really think about the causal decision structures at play uh, so that we can introduce the correct types of policy interventions and marketing and awareness campaigns and so on. So you can think about, you know, does well-being, you know, if you're in a state of, uh, you know, good well-being, does that motivate travel? You like to go about doing things? Or on the other hand, do you travel in order to achieve some well-being outcome? So what is really the cause and effect there? Similarly, in search of a happy job, a very good job, are you willing to tolerate a bad commute so you can have a happy job? Or on the other hand, are you looking for a good, nice commute so that you can be happy when you get to your job? So these are you know, interesting causal uh, decisions and structures that you can think about. So then we took all of these and we conducted a little poll uh, of our uh, of our group uh, to see if we could prioritize the three highest. So we kind of bundled a couple together, but then we had this poll, and you can see we actually got 24 responses, even though I think I accidentally voted twice. But, <laughs> but, uh, but my choices didn't come out as the top three, so you cannot accuse me of stuffing the ballot box. Um, so we uh, did that poll and then uh, essentially tried to focus on topics that were, we thought were somewhat germane to our workshop, but also things that we wanted to talk about. So we formed into uh, three groups. And these were the ones that we tackled in a little more depth. Uh, one is definition, defining subjective and objective measures of well-being and how do we advance that conversation uh, coming up with the appropriate measures and, uh, you know, with, for transport applications, for transport studies. The other was the influence of the built environment and multimodal access and to what extent transport influences access to healthy choices and opportunities. Um, and then the causal decision processes, uh, causal structures and understanding cause and effect relationships uh, remains a very underlying foundation of a lot of what we do. So uh, that was another one. So for each of these, I'll do a couple of quick uh, slides uh, to give you uh, some of the concepts and considerations. I don't know if we could go far enough to deliver what Costas wanted, uh, but uh, we made some progress uh, in our conversations. So we had three groups. Uh, Pat led one group, I chaperoned one group, and Dick Adama, thank you very much, uh, led another group. So the one on uh, defining subjective and objective measures of well-being for use in transport studies and, and surveys and so on, we thought we need to recognize uh, and integrate the hierarchy of human needs, uh, derive insights from multiple disciplines. So there's the higher, I guess Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, and perhaps we need to consider that hierarchy in defining uh, these uh, measures of well-being. Um, also mapping to community goals and objectives. Uh, so perhaps these measures of well-being need to consider community goals and objectives. So often when I go to India and I complain about air quality in New Delhi, you know, one of the policy makers will tell me, well, we just can't worry about air quality when half of our population is starving to death, right? So the community goals and their definition of well-being could be very different based on the context and the situation in which they're placed. Um, we need some of these objective measures of quality and access that go beyond what the traffic engineers can, you know, have traditionally considered as measures of quality and access, where the emphasis has tended to be perhaps on speed, capacity, and level of service. So how from a behavioral and from a quality of life perspective can we start influencing the transportation ecosystem in coming up with more holistic measures of level of service, of quality of access to opportunities. And uh, we think that developing measures of well-being, again, it's kind of a loaded question. Uh, there's many dimensions to trying to define measures of well-being. There's the scale, individual measures versus societal. There's the uh, type, subjective versus objective physical and mental, uh, and then a temporal scale from episodic or momentary, instantaneous uh, measures of well-being all the way to your overall life. 
Um, and then you can also think about market segments, what might be of, you know, measures of well-being suitable to a child might be very different compared to a measure of well-being for somebody who is much, you know, the elderly. So we need to consider these market segments. So an action plan is to review the measures and concepts that uh, appear in many different disciplines. How do we integrate mobility and transportation considerations in some of the existing indices that various agencies use. So for example, the United Nations has some sort of a happiness index, but uh, we're not quite sure if they actually consider mobility or transportation in that index. How can we influence some of these organizations to start incorporating and integrating mobility and transportation considerations? If they do consider transportation, it's usually fatality rates. We need to go well beyond that. Um, in terms of an action plan, we really felt we need to engage stakeholders and start perhaps working with them and trying to convince them to integrate well-being into their measures and into their processes uh, as they go about uh, formulating policies and so on. Uh, but at the same time, we also, also want to understand from a public's perspective what are the ingredients of happiness and quality of life that they are looking for, and how and why do they consider certain activities or opportunities to be of high quality or to you know, that provide them happiness versus uh, not providing happiness. Um, we're trying to tie everything to mapping the genome, so at least there we're trying to achieve uh, something there, connecting with the conference. Um, so I guess there's some literature that shows the genetic predisposition pretty much accounts for half of your, um, you know, happiness, so to speak, your state of happiness. So how can transport affect the other 50% uh, considering the genetic predisposition that already exists in many of us? Um, so the next one, uh, which uh, Dick Edema had led, was the influence of the built environment on well-being, and some of the concepts and considerations that came out of that discussion was that we need to go beyond the built environment. Now we have a virtual environment, we have a social environment, and perhaps there's other environments we haven't even thought of, but the physical, virtual, and social are becoming perhaps increasingly intertwined increasingly difficult to disentangle. And um, so perhaps it's important to really think about how these interact with one another and uh, how they all together um, influence well-being and quality of life. Um, also considering the importance of social norms and expectations in shaping choices and the resultant feelings of well-being. We just talked about I just mentioned the virtual environment, so that's the virtual and social networks on well-being and local interaction. So now you're connected to people millions or thousands of miles away, but uh, perhaps you're no longer connected within your local community. So is some of this virtual environment impacting the social cohesion uh, of your local built environment? And so those kinds of trade-offs are perhaps worthy of study. Um, also, uh, there was some discussion about the value of choice. Um, so as you have a built environment with many options or you know, multimodal options and so on, how does the, what, what's the value of having those choices and those options on happiness and the ability to engage in green behaviors? Um, so as an action plan, uh, we thought uh, there should be some data collection. Uh, so collect data on interactions within and between uh, physical, uh, the built, the virtual, and the social environments, measure quality of experience. Um, we seem to be emphasizing a lot uh, populations in cities and urban environments, and perhaps more in developed countries, but how about the developing regions? Uh, what constitutes you know, well-being in developing countries and developing and rural regions, and how does the built virtual and social environments interact in their context? Um, also, uh, the very, how does the impact of built environment vary by personality and personal needs and desires? So we need to think about a multifaceted data collection effort. Um, here again, we thought we need to draw perhaps from cognitive neuroscience, uh, neurosciences 
to understand neurological responses to these stimuli. So I was at a safety seminar and somebody said they, they keep using the uh, cell phone or smartphone during driving because of the dopamine, I don't know, the rush of dopamine or something that gives a certain stimulus. So I guess there is a neurological process to think about uh, in this. Finally, uh, Pat led a uh, subgroup on causal decision processes underlying happiness and choices and some of the concepts there, looking at alternative causal structures. So do people travel more because they're happy or do people travel more to derive happiness, to become happy? So we need to observe behaviors and well-being over time. So the longitudinal aspect here is critical to infer cause and effect processes at play. Are probably preaching to the choir, but it's something we need to convince agencies to really pursue in terms of their own uh, data collection and so on. Um, really think about well-being as a multi-dimensional construct, so that tied back to the definition subgroup in terms of defining uh, well-being measures along multiple scales and dimensions, the physical, mental, social, genetic, environmental, and so on. Uh, looking at dynamics through the life course that will again help us try to uh, understand the cause and effect relationships that play out over a life course. Um, and also perhaps try to understand the notion of relative well-being. So uh, if you kind of compare to yourself to peers and your social circle um, and so on, how does that impact your own perception of your own well-being? Uh, depends on who you compare yourself to, right? So. Um, and in terms of a bit of an action plan, again, uh, we feel we need to really understand what's happening in various disciplines uh, in, this, uh, in this context in understanding and, and uh, being able to derive cause and effect relationships, collection of data to derive insights. So this is all types of data, the full spectrum, um, and perhaps trying to take advantage of data fusion approaches uh, because it's hard to collect all of this data in a single, uh, single enterprise. There are certainly challenges in collecting this type of data, and we need to address some of the research questions and, uh, in, in how best to collect a lot of these types of different types of data. Perhaps retrospective questions aren't necessarily as effective in obtaining longitudinal data as it is to actually observe people uh, over time. Uh, derive lessons from medical panels, and perhaps you don't need to really observe somebody over the entire life course, maybe five to ten years is sufficient to give you some longitudinal data. So again, mapping to the genome, understanding innate personality traits that perhaps influence these cause and effect uh, processes. So here is the happy, happy group in action. Uh, so we, uh, we had a lot of happiness uh, in the group. Thank you, and I do want to thank the rapporteurs uh, for, their, uh, for their contributions. Thank you all.